you know, I goes back to high school. Um, I didn't think I was a history nerd back then, but I had a teacher in my junior year that what I always say is taught outside the book. And by that, I mean, um, textbooks tend to be written in a certain way to tell a certain story to a certain group. And he, he taught, Mr. Jacob Robinson, taught outside the book and that I learned about um, African-American inventors um, and other things that were going on that weren't necessarily even put as sidebars in the history books. And that got me interested in the rest of the story. So the local history, um, shortly there after high school, I had my cousins come visit. And so I put together a tour of Grand Rapids. But as I drove around thinking about what I would tell them, I thought, well, there's this other story. It's not just about what's there. It's what was there before. And so that's, that's really where it started. So um, museums offer education programming. They offer exhibitions that talk about the history of the region. Um, in my opinion, the better ones talk about it in a greater context. The local story is woven into the national story and the world story. One of my favorite books was Timetables of History because I could interweave into my history what was going on in the arts and what was going on in battle or conflict and all the different aspects brought together. And a museum does that if the exhibit is pulled together in in a good way. Um, it is also an opportunity to just really step back and immerse um, the public museum where I was for 30 years, starting as a volunteer, now ending as a volunteer, so it's actually been more than 30 years, um, does that with the streets of old Grand Rapids. You are, you are present within that time period of the 1890s by stepping in there. Whereas the people of this place um, you are immersed in the lives of the Native Americans, and then when you step into the newcomers portion of that exhibit, they interweave the stories of all these different people at, with questions that, you know, why did, why did you come here? And all of us have a story, unless we are Native people, we have a story of why we came to Grand Rapids, whether our parents brought us, our grandparents brought us, but we historically came here for um, in, in different ways. And so that's really the first question that's asked there. So um, I think that they can, museums can make us think, uh, they can make us see things differently. Um, and sometimes they're just fun. For my, me personally, one of the most satisfying was newcomers. I was privileged to sit on at the table with the community members that the museum brought together, including people like David Pilgrim, who um, is up at Ferris State University and has the Jim Crow Museum now, um, and people from the Jewish community and the Polish community and the um, African American community, all of these different groups with an interest in telling the complete story and answering these simple questions about why did you come here, were at the table. And so I learned so much from them and heard firsthand their stories of their community as they saw it, not just from a book or from papers that I, or, or um, meaning archival papers that I could read. So that was the most satisfying exhibit. Um, and I like going through there still. And I gave tours in there to groups for a long time. 
um, including groups like the Chamber of Commerce and um, school groups, high school groups, college groups, and getting them to look at it, not just on the surface of what artifacts are there. Most people don't wanna read all the labels. And that's just a reality. So I was able to in, hopefully engage them in seeing it for what it is. I think that they uh, need to and should connect in um, ways, whether it's through uh, historians utilizing what the museum has most historical societies, many historical societies, I should say, do not have collections. The Grand Rapids Historical Society does not have their own collections. What we do is write papers. Um, we have newsletters that go out with a little more in-depth or stories you might not hear. Um, some of them have small collections. They're usually very hyper-focused on that small area. Um, like the Ada Historical Society might just have things related to Ada's development, which is, which is fine because it tells the bigger story, but really they are more archival and programmatic where they provide programs um, today virtually, but, um, or in, in person, hopefully soon. Um, so they're more the deliverer of the history uh, and less the collector of the history as far as objects. Well, the Historical Society has been around for a very long time, over 100 years. Um, it um, has a board that uh, consists of community members that are interested in history. We try to do eight programs a year. Um, we have struggled a little bit getting onto the, the pandemic train, I guess, if you will, um, doing the virtual programs we're getting there. We just had another successful one. Um, so we do programming, we have a website um, we have a Facebook page. We answer people's questions uh, that send in uh, questions. We have published publications such as um, a book on the 1956 tornadoes. Um, we collaborated by providing our members uh, the connections along the, the grand, which the Coochie Center put out. So we were very happy to do that because that was an interesting publication in that it went from, uh, from one end of the center of the Grand River to the uh, Grand Haven, which um, gives people an opportunity one to go out in their car and investigate and enjoy. Um, so those, our mission is to provide programming um, for the public um, of local history and, and hopefully tying it into the larger picture. With um, things like Facebook or other means of communicating electronically, um, we can fill in even from people from further away that have left the region and have some of that information. Um, and so they can add to it. But um, I look at local historians like the late Carl Bajima amassed, um, I think there are like 1600, I am not exaggerating, notebooks that were donated to the library by him and his estate, um, and they cover every topic imaginable um, because Carol didn't filter out. If he was researching, his big research was trolleys and the interurban railroads, 
but he had amassed a great collection of newspaper clippings on African Americans in the Grand Rapids, West Michigan community, on women in the same. Um, so his, most historians that I know get caught up in the tangential, the, the things that, the little fingers that go out from the topic they're really looking up and end up adding to a much more filled out history. Um, so, and then most, all the historians I know want to put that out there to the community. They want to share that. They want others to know. We don't do the research just to satisfy ourselves. We, we are hopeful and we think that others will want to know it also. Oh, there are so many. I actually wrote down some, and it wasn't just as the historical society. Um, through the museum, if I may jump to that, there is a collection of photographs by a gentleman by the name of Seymour Bieber. And it was of a time period that I'm very familiar with because I was growing up, I was in high school, um, in college, during the 19, late 50s and the through 1960s. And it's on the urban renewal that happened downtown. And it is not just the destruction of the buildings, but it's the building of the new buildings. And I find it fascinating that this one person went out and took, we have 966 slides from him in the museum's collection. So I'm still working with those as a volunteer. I worked with them as a, as a staff member at the museum. Um, so that's, that's one of them. We found a picture, uh, we had a question at the museum as a volunteer, as one of this team photo about a, um, there's a bunch of women statues that are dressed in what I'll call diaphanous gowns and they're, they're like bases for lamps. And there's confusion over to who made them. There's stories in families. And then one of them came up as a bowling ball stand. What? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. So we went into the furniture exhibit or the furniture archive room where all the furniture is that isn't on display. And we found this stand and we were able to see that it had an indentation on the top where the bowling ball would sit. And there was something on there, it's called quake wax and it's to stabilize kind of a sticky wax that, so when the bowling ball was on it, it wouldn't roll off. And this was made as an award. Um, and we ended up having the photographer um, at the museum take a picture of the bowling ball and the stand together so that it's in the record. I mean, who wouldn't want to see a bowling ball stand with a bowling ball on it, right? Um, through the Historical Society, we've been involved in a thing called the History Detectives at the Public Library. It's a collaboration of a lot of groups, including the Coochie Center. Um, I learned about Merce Tate, a woman from either Macaster or Montcalm County. Um, she was remarkable. And I was just so excited to learn about her. She was an African-American woman who lived up in, in an area where that was, she was not the norm. Um, but she was just a remarkable woman. And so I, I, by going to the history detectives, I had this aha moment about someone I knew nothing about. Um, so as, as the historical society, we bring in these programs and I don't always know the topic. And that's the whole idea. I hope I don't always know the topic. And um, those are things that I really, really like about being involved in, in that organization. Personally, I would say if you're interested in um, a local area, because hopefully this will be seen all over, so it wouldn't just be West Michigan, um, we have several uh, Facebook groups. Uh, 
uh, West Michigan history then and now, um, if you grew up in Grand Rapids, Kent County, and people put information out there and looking for answers. And so those are really a good way. Um, your local historical societies have uh, their, their hours are less than say a library and most libraries have a local history room. Um, but find out when those hours are, make an appointment. Um, there are, um, if you're searching a certain neighborhood, you can find things that are called Sanborn maps. Different places will hold those. Grand Rapids is lucky enough to have a archive. Uh, Tony Wright and Matt uh, Ellis are there and you can make appointments. I don't know if right now, but I know they will go look up stuff for you and, and talk to people. If you know somebody else who's a history geek, you know, get to know them and they're going to know someone who knows someone. I think that's really important. Um, and then search out things on, don't trust the internet for the whole true story. A good example of that is a story about a tragedy occurred. Um, it was a murder suicide, a double suicide. I it, It's hard to know because of the way the tragedy occurred. It happened in 1909 in Grand Rapids. In doing some research, I thought I had found the house where this occurred in a picture in the museum's collection. And so because we were at the archives of the museum, we have all the press photographs or uh, the bound press uh, archive. We could not find this because everything on the internet said it happened in 1910. And we couldn't find it because we couldn't find the right name. And it was very frustrating. And it was supposedly a haunted building. A building was built where this house had been. They had the wrong year, the wrong names of the people. So it was our mission to compile information about the real story. And it was a tragedy. It's a, it's a horrible, grim tale. But we dug deeper because we wanted to know the real story. And I say we, it was the group, this team photo. Um, and so that leads me to primary sources. Um, the internet doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily a primary source. I double check everything, even people who I, I trust. I just wanna know where did they find that information? Um, it, it, and, what you know what was their source um i want to know i like it when people put up a picture and cite the source of that picture it helps me i don't know i guess i should say settle in my mind that okay that that makes sense and also if someone wants to look at that picture it's very exciting that the public museum has made almost all of their photographs in the public domain which is which is very cool so you can you know feel you can download it without anybody looking over your shoulder if you will um i don't know if that answers the question but i i think the searching out other historians um and checking your sources um utilizing your libraries. And um, I always look for publications that were printed or written at the time. There was a book, uh, The History of Grand Rapids by Albert Baxter, written in 1891. I use that sometimes for my starting point. Books by noted people, um, uh, African Americans in the Furniture City uh, by Randall Jelk, a divergent view that you won't necessarily get. Um, Christian Carone wrote the Furniture City book, but it's really about the companies, not as much about the people. Um, it, and so, you know, find other sources too for what you're, what you're interested in. 
it's the whole story not being told. Um, there are, when you're talking about the history, it's one thing to have a photograph and trying to identify it. There is, it's a very limited story, probably. But when you're telling um, the story of, a, let's just, I'm gonna, a church congregation. There is a lot that goes into that story. Um, and it, it could be as simple as nothing from the youth, um, how, how youth saw that congregation. But real silences in the archives are the African-American story not being told, the Asian-American story not being told. Um, it, in a Dutch neighborhood, the Polish story not being told because there was, and I know of this personally, there was a lot of conflict between those two groups. Um, the, um, uh, those silences are almost deafening when you actually find out about the truth that it's like, oh, I hadn't even considered that. And I think that's the biggest harm is that as historians, we have to consider that. And I will go back to the Carl Bajima uh, binders that he, he thought of that, he caught that, that this article is not about trolleys, but I haven't read a lot about the African-Americans in Grand Rapids. So I'm gonna clip that article while I'm here on this page so that I don't lose sight of that. And he'd cite where he got it, the year it was written. Um, so we are fortunate for that, in the, that a researcher can go in and see these newspaper clippings without going through months of microfilm or years of microfilm. Um, so those silences are the um, disparity that occurs with um, stories like redlining um, and um, the, uh, the museum in, in the newcomers exhibit has the story of Auburn Hills, which is a community over on the Northeast end. Those are important stories because that tells that there was a, there was a group of people that weren't allowed to really build in these I call them the three bedroom brick ranch neighborhoods. Um, that's just my own term. So they developed their own um, and they were not allowed because of the color of their skin. And um, that, those are important stories for us to remember when we're talking about history. Historians need to be aware of those stories that aren't being told so that they can fill in those gaps of those silences that are in the archives. The public museum, when it was on Jefferson, had an open house once a year, open house weekend. And volunteers like myself, at the time I was a volunteer, would populate the Gaslight Village shops. It was a street 1850s-ish. So we would um, populate those so that visitors could come in. Normally those shops were locked unless we had a school group and we only went in a few of them. And I was assigned to the police station that was there. And in there, there was this mug shop book. I became fascinated. It's from 1897 to about 1915. And there's, there's pictures of these people. And there's the measurements and the scars that are on them. Like they thought that the, the size of your ear of two people wouldn't be the same. I don't, it, it's a whole, it's a measurement system they use to identify people. It just fascinated me. So years later when I um, was on the board of the, the historical society, I. I said, I love the mugshot book. I'd love to do a program on that someday. They said, this was in the spring. They said, well, we'll put you on for October. So I had to 
I had to go start really looking at that book. And it would tell where they were from, their nativity, meaning where they were born, um, all kinds of things about them. And I thought, this is a good lesson on crime in Grand Rapids. It's a good lesson on, for a genealogist, you might find the only picture ever taken of a relative that sort of disappeared due to their life of crime. Um, it was a lesson in our um, justice system. There was a terrible murder. Um, they were picked up and they were in Marquette within a week of the crime in the Marquette's prison. Wow. I mean, now that would be a good year, mm -hmm. maybe before that crime was tried and everything settled. But it was within a week. They were sentenced to life in prison, sent up to Marquette. Um, the style of clothing can be judged from that mugshot book. They were all pretty nicely dressed. Um, there's wonderful stories. I actually dug into a genealogybank.com is, is a website and you can look at newspaper articles. And so I joined for a year to do this project and looked at all the different um, articles about these, these crimes that occurred. My favorite, I do have to say, is of the clairvoyant who was put in jail and tried to escape. And why didn't she know that that hallway was a dead end? If she's clairvoyant, shouldn't she have known that? <laughs> One of my favorites. Um, and it shows the type of crime and what they would get away. What they, we had a big carnival in Grand Rapids in the fall in October of one year. And I wondered what the suspect PP was. And it took me some investigating, but because these people were arrested and then they were let go without ever charging them. They were without being brought to trial or any incarceration other than that short duration. Suspect pickpocket. They were coming to pickpockets at the carnival and the police watched and they would put, they put a number of gentlemen in jail for the weekend of carnival. So there's just these delightful um, stories. And um, I just found that book fascinating. The city archive um, has, not the museum's archive, but the city archive has at least one other mugshot book. Um, I think maybe two. Unfortunately, the one they have, we have number one in the museum's archive and they have number three and four, I think. But number two disappeared. But there's so many different ways to use that mugshot book. And like I said, there's the picture of a family member that may not have ever otherwise been taken. It's just fascinating because there's so much information on each of the cards. You can go into the museum's grpmcollections.org, studying Asian Americans in Grand Rapids in the early years. Um, if you go through the early city directories, which I love city directories. I have, my husband and I have a collection of them. Um, my, my oldest one is 1929, but they, they were in the 1870s. Um, the, you can do it by looking at last names or, um, and not to put it in a category, but a lot of the laundries were owned by um, Asian Americans. I think, the earliest, um, the 1873-74 city directory, I was looking up J.C. Craig, who was an early barber who I knew was African-American. He's featured in the newcomers exhibit. Um, he was very successful. And behind his name in 1873, it's C-O-L apostrophe D in parentheses in 
in the city directory. So somebody researching that could go to that city directory and the painstaking go through all of the names and see where they lived because it will tell you where they lived and what their um, occupation was, if it's known. I haven't come across, um, that's an interesting thing though for the mugshot book that the museum owns because that's earlier if there are Hispanic surnames in there. Hmm. I think there might be a list of the surnames. I gave the museum all for the accession file. I gave them all of my notes and a lot of other things because an association with that and a list of the people in it because that's where it belongs because that's where the mugshot book is. You will find in the early one at least, because they did change the cards, the, the mugshot book uh, cards, and they may be different in the uh, city archives than the museum archive book because they were using was the Bertillon method of this measuring that was in there. But it would say what color their eyes were, what their skin tone was. Um, it might say swarthy, but it, it might say dark. Um, it, um, it's fascinating to read them because of, and then it tells you scars um, and um, different physical features. If, if they were arrested before, if they were arrested later, it might get added to the book. <clears throat> um, so there's a lot, and it also <clears throat> will sometimes tell where they lived, so you can kind of trace where that person is from. With the mugshot book, they tell their nativity or what country they are from, um, if they are if they are foreign born, um, which is helpful. And I never read every single card when I was doing it. I was on a timeline. <laughs> I was trying to find some interesting things, um, a variety of crime. I avoided a few crimes just because I didn't want to, I didn't want to go there. And it was my program. City directories are fascinating because they, they have a list of the streets. So you could look down a street to see, and they will say who was there or what business was there. So if you wanted to know a certain neighborhood who lived there, you could just go to the street like Jefferson Southeast. Um, and then you can also look up businesses. So there's a business directory. And um, then, or you can look up people by their last names. And always, always, always as a researcher, consider different spellings. <laughs> because they didn't always get it right. The directory was only as good as the information they were getting. It's pretty accurate, but um, you know, it, you have to think of things like if it's in the 1953 directory, they probably acquired that information in 1952. So don't assume that that person lived there in 1950 three, unless you check the 1954 directory. They give us an incomplete picture. Um, if we truly wanna know the history of an area, a city, a state, um, a, a community with, within a community, we have to fill those silences or we don't really know. Um, I, I, I personally can't know that experience of someone else. Um, in Grand Rapids, I grew up on the Northeast end. I can't know the experiences of someone on the Southeast end because there was a totally different demographic. So those silences getting, if we don't fill them, we don't know the experience that others had. Um, we just don't.
And so we don't know the complete story, the complete history. And as a historian, I would like to know the whole story and the complete history of an area. Um, and I think it's important that even if you don't care about history, that you know the whole story. Um, because I think it would bring us a better understanding of how, where we are today by knowing where we've been and perhaps hopefully change where we go. It sounds simplistic, but I think it's important. Be aware. I think that just knowing that they exist is, is important because then you'll be aware of them as you are doing your research and know that if you see it out of the corner of your eye, you better grab onto it and write it down. 